Welcome to Eyelet's listening test. Please do subscribe our YouTube channel, like the video and click on the bell icon for daily listening videos. Share your listening band score in the comments section below at the end of the test. Here's someone talking about rail travel. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Today we're going to be talking about luxury rail travel. It all started with George Pullman, didn't it? <laughs> yes. The man who began luxury train travel was called George Mortimer Pullman. He was born in the USA on the 3rd of March, 1831, the son of a builder. However, when he arrived in Chicago in 1859, he spent his first few years there raising offices and houses and constructing new foundations. This was necessary because much of the Chicago area was only a meter or so above the level of Lake Michigan, and the streets were often flooded. Pullman took the money he earned from this and moved on to develop a new venture, railroad carriages. Pullman began by remodeling two standard passenger carriages into sleeping carriages. His first service was between Chicago and Bloomington, Illinois. Heating came from wood-burning stoves and the light from candles. Steam heating replaced the wood stoves only in the 1880s, and electric lights came in in the 1890s. Business grew slowly but steadily until the Civil War. In 1862, he left Chicago for the Colorado gold fields, where he opened a store and, in his spare time, continued to develop his ideas about railway carriages. Returning to Chicago, Pullman constructed the Pioneer Carriage in 1865, which became a classic in rail history. Orders began to pour in, and Pullman built a new plant on the shores of Lake Calumet, several kilometers from Chicago. Between 1880 and 1884, in an effort to make it easier for his employees, he constructed a town near the factory. All the houses were leased, employees weren't allowed to buy, and Pullman sold water and gas to his own workers at a 10% premium. The railroad carriage business made him a fortune. Pullman only leased his carriages, never sold them. With over 2,000 of them on the rails, his company was worth $62 million by 1893. When business fell off in 1894, Pullman cut jobs, wages, and working hours, but not house rents. His employees went on strike. This was eventually broken by government troops. Pullman's reputation was ruined. A government report condemned him for refusing to negotiate and for creating economic hardships for his workers. Pullman died in 1897. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So, how are Pullman and the Orient Express connected? Well, it all started in 1868, when Georges Nagelmakers, the son of a Belgian banker, visited the USA. And while there, he traveled in the railway carriages built by an American called George Mortimer Pullman. He was very impressed, and on his return to Europe, Nagelmakers decided to start Europe's first luxury train service. This, in fact, took another 13 years because of problems in Europe. But finally, in 1883, he launched the Orient Express. The train consisted of two baggage cars, 
one for mail and the other to hold passengers' luggage. Then came two sleeping cars and the dining car, which was lit by gas chandeliers. The original route was from Paris to Romania via Munich and Vienna. In Romania, passengers were taken across the Danube to Bulgaria to pick up another train to Varna, from where they finished the trip to Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, by ferry. It wasn't until 1889 that there was a direct rail line to Istanbul. Then, in 1905, the journey time between Paris and Venice was cut when a tunnel at just over 20 kilometers, the world's longest, was completed. This allowed the introduction of a more southerly route via Milan, Venice, and Trieste to Istanbul. The journey between Paris and Istanbul took several days. Passengers relaxed in their compartments where they had wash basins and comfortable beds. The fares were very high, but then so was the level of comfort. The train was a great success. The Orient Express went into decline in the 1950s and 60s as air travel became cheaper and faster. However, it continued to operate until 1977. In 1982, the route was reborn when the company was bought by James Sherwood. Now, turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a phone conversation giving information about a health and fitness centre. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello? Hello. Is that Ms Heidi Jones? Yes. Good morning, Ms Jones. I'd like to take a few minutes of your time to tell you about the Seven Oaks Health and Fitness Centre which is in your suburb. Would that be convenient? OK. Well, the centre's not far from you. It's on the corner of Marion Street and Giles Street and has a large car park. It's open every day of the week, opening on weekdays at 6am and at 9am at the weekend. It closes at 9.30pm Monday to Friday and on Saturday at 4pm and Sunday at 2pm. We also have childcare Monday to Saturday from 9 in the morning until midday for a small extra charge, so you can leave your children in safe hands while you attend one of our classes, or perhaps have a swim, or if you just want to relax in the spa and sauna or steam room. Talking of classes, we have a very wide range which are designed to suit all different levels of fitness and individual needs. I mentioned the pool just now. Well, in addition to swimming laps or just relaxing, we also offer aqua aerobic classes, which are 45 minute classes that use the therapeutic effects of water. This provides a very safe and effective exercise and is suitable for all fitness levels, as well as being a lot of fun. Many people who haven't been exercising for a while start in the aqua classes, as do people who need to take care after hospital surgery, for example. 
These classes are very popular and are scheduled every weekday, Monday to Friday, and on Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning. Another very popular activity in the pool area is learning to swim, and these swimming classes are held at 4pm every weekday and in the mornings at the weekend. By the way, they're open to both adults and children of any age. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, as the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Now, it would take too much of your time to tell you in detail about all our programs, as we have a very wide range of activities at different times. However, I'll just outline some of them. Our super circuit classes are extremely popular and you get a good aerobic workout while toning your muscles. They're easy to learn as you combine using hydraulic equipment with exercises guaranteed to give you a good cardio workout. The teachers are very good and there's a fun atmosphere. And the classes are very effective in assisting weight loss, relieving stress, lowering blood pressure and generally increasing fitness. Oh, and I haven't mentioned our range of aerobic and step classes of different types which suit all levels. Our specially designed aerobics room holds over 55 people and our highly qualified and trained staff can advise you as to which class might suit you. We are inviting you to a free one week trial period when you can come and try any of the classes or activities before you make the decision to join. By the way, there is also a large and very well equipped gym where we offer free fitness assessments and you can have an individual program designed just for you. Also, the cardiovascular room has the latest range of machines which help you burn fat, increase your fitness or just warm up. They are very popular as you can forget all about the calorie burning by watching your favourite music videos on TV while you exercise. Right now we have a very special new member joining fee offer, which allows two memberships for the price of one, a real bargain. So if you can, bring along a friend who'd like to get fit as well in time for summer. Come along and try us out. You can meet the staff. Try out some of the classes for a week, absolutely free. And then, if you like us, Sign up for only $110 each for six months. Thanks for taking the time to learn about the centre and I hope we'll see you there soon, Heidi. I'll put one of our brochures in the mail for you right now. Bye for now. That is the end of section two. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a student called Greg talking to his student about the study of the wind farm in Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, Greg. So I finally managed to read the article you submitted, the one about the study of the wind farm in Australia. You did? Great! What did you think of it? Yeah, I was a little confused at first because of the background information you failed to present on the paper. I mean, it's kind of important for you to give some general knowledge before you start actually writing on the main theme. Oh, I was thinking of doing that during the presentation session, but now that you have mentioned it, I could add it to the beginning of the essay. I've done some research on that, to think about the different ways that people use wind. Wind is one of our cleanest and richest sources of power, as well as one of the oldest. Windmills began to be used in ancient Iran back in 7th century BC. They were first introduced to Europe during the 1100s, when armies returned from the Middle East with knowledge of using wind power. For many centuries, people used windmills to grind wheat into flour or pump water from deep underneath the ground. During the 1970s, people started becoming concerned about the pollution that is created when coal and gas are burned to produce electricity. People also realized that the supply of coal and gas would not last forever. Then, wind was rediscovered and carried out into research for the first time. Greg, why don't you just put all that information together and present that in the introduction part of your essay? OK, I'll do that. What also intrigued me was that there were disadvantages about a wind farm. You see, all the conventional green scenarios for reducing carbon emissions include a dramatic upscaling in renewable power generated by wind, both on and offshore. However, the environmental impacts of this large-scale industrial deployment, both of turbines and power lines, frequently in relatively natural areas, are often neglected by climate campaigners. For example, wind turbines have the reputation of generating noise as well as electricity. So as more electricity is produced, they can be really noisy. Another thing is that some new turbine blades kill a worrying number of birds, especially large birds like raptors. But there must be a bright side, right? Yeah, of course. According to figures pulled together by consultants of the intelligent energy systems using data from the Australian market operator, wind energy accounted for 50% of demand in the state. That's half of the power source. Besides, this one unexpected outcome really attracts lots of visitors and helps the local tourism. That's good to hear. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Oh, how about the structure? Offshore wind farms consist of a number of connected elements. These include the turbines, foundations, array cables, offshore substation, export cable, and onshore substation and infrastructure. Just a single one of these giant wind turbine blades produced by manufacturer Siemens, is almost as big as the Airbus A380, the world's largest plane. That's made in Europe. Impressive. Actually, at first, there were protests among residents who claimed themselves to be victims of land loss and noise. Then, policies came out really quick, and then they could get allowance from the government. From then on, things went smoothly. What would happen in extreme weather conditions? I mean, it could be dangerous if hurricanes occur. A motorized operating mechanism enables the device to be switched back on remotely. All versions feature the modular design and share the same complete range of standard accessories, thanks to its very extensive operating temperature range of minus 25 
to 70 Celsius and its strong temperature range of minus 40 to 70 Celsius. It is ideally suited for use in wind turbines under extreme climatic conditions, though they do have an option to lower the speed of it. Wonderful. Then, what were the fans, or turbine blades, made of? Is it a special kind of metal? No, they were too heavy. Wind turbine blades must be strong, light, and capable of operating for decades without much, if any, maintenance. Fiberglass is one of the main components of many large-scale wind turbine blades. The material is used because it is lightweight, easily shaped, and not too expensive. Another material used to make longer turbine blades is timber. This material is too expensive to use amongst all the blades, but on the longer blades, it's used to help reinforce them because it is stiff and light. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a lecture giving advice on how to present a seminar paper. First read questions 31 to 40. Complete the notes of the outline. Write no more than three words in each answer. In this talk, I am going to give some advice on how to present a seminar paper. At one time, most university teaching took the form of giving formal lectures. Nowadays, many university teachers try to involve their students more actively in the learning process. One of the ways in which this is done is by conducting seminars. In a seminar, what usually happens is this. One student is chosen to give his ideas on a certain topic. These ideas are then discussed by the other students, the participants in the seminar. What I'd like to discuss with you today is the techniques of presenting a paper at a seminar. As you know, there are two main stages involved in this. One is the preparation stage, which involves researching and writing up a topic. The other stage is the presentation stage, when you actually present the paper to your audience. It is this second stage that I am now concerned with. Let us therefore imagine that you have been asked to lead off a seminar discussion and that you have done all the necessary preparation. In other words, you have done the research and you have written it up. How are you going to present it? There are two ways in which this can be done. The first method is to circulate copies of the paper in advance to all the participants. This gives them time to read it before the seminar so that they can come already prepared with their own ideas about what you have written. The second method is where there is no time for previous circulation or there is some other reason why the paper cannot be circulated. In that case, of course, the paper will have to be read aloud to the group who will probably make their own notes on it while they are listening. In this talk, I am going to concentrate on the first method where the paper is circulated in advance, as this is a most efficient way of conducting a seminar. But most of what I am going to say also applies to the second method, and indeed may be useful to remember any time you have to speak in public. You will probably be expected to introduce your paper even if it has been circulated beforehand. There are two good reasons for this. One is that the participants may have read the paper but forgotten some of the main points. The second reason is that some of the participants may not in fact have had time to read your paper, although they may have glanced through it quickly. They will therefore not be in a position to comment on it unless they get some idea of what it is all about. When you are introducing your paper, what you must not do is simply read the whole paper aloud. This is because, firstly, if the paper is a fairly long one, 
there may not be enough time for discussion. From your point of view, the discussion is the most important thing. It is very helpful for you if other people criticize your work. In that way, you can improve it. Secondly, a lot of information can be understood when one is reading. It is not so easy to pick up detailed information when one is listening. In other words, there may be a lack of comprehension or understanding. Thirdly, it can be very boring listening to something being read aloud. Anyway, some of your audience may have read your paper carefully and will not thank you for having to go through all of it again. Therefore, what you must do is follow the following nine points. One, decide on a time limit for your talk. Tell the audience what it is. Stick to your time limit. This is very important. Two, write out your spoken presentation in the way that you intend to say it. This means that you must do some of the work of writing the paper again, in a sense. You may think that this is a waste of time, but it isn't. If a speaker tries to make a summary of his paper while he is standing in front of his audience, the results are usually disastrous. 3. Concentrate only on the main points. Ignore details. Hammer home the essence of your argument. If necessary, find ways of making your basic points so that your audience will be clear about what they are. 4. Try to make your spoken presentation lively and interesting. This doesn't necessarily mean telling jokes and anecdotes. But if you can, think of interesting or amusing examples to illustrate your argument. Use them. 5. If you are not used to speaking in public, write out everything you have to say, including example, etc. Rehearse what you are going to say until you are word perfect. 6. When you know exactly what you are going to say, reduce it to outline notes. Rehearse your talk again, this time from the outline notes. Make sure you can find your way easily from the outline notes to the full notes in case you forget something. 7. At the seminar, speak from the outline notes, but bring both sets of notes and your original paper to the meeting. Knowing that you have a full set of notes available will be good for your self-confidence. 8. Look at your audience while you are speaking. The technique to use is this. First, read the appropriate parts of your notes silently. If you are using outline notes, this won't take long. Then, look up at your audience and say what you have to say. Never speak while you are still reading. While you are looking at your audience, try to judge what they are thinking. Are they following you? You will never make contact with your audience if your eyes are fixed on the paper in front of you. 9. Make a strong ending. One good way of doing this is to repeat your main points briefly and invite questions or comments. Perhaps I can sum up by saying this. Remember that listening is very different from reading. Something that is going to be listened to has therefore got to be prepared in a different way from something that is intended to be read. That is the end of section four. You will have half a minute to check your answer.